This is the second part of our talk on forearm fractures from the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series version 4. I'm Saki Brahman narrating and this is a PowerPoint presentation created by Dr. Derek uh, Donegan and um, revised from previous authors. Uh, in our first part we talked about assessment, um, clinical assessment, radiographic assessment, the concept of the forearm um, you know, the radial bow being very critical to restoration of function and therefore um, forearm fractures in some ways being treated like articular fractures in that a lot of times anat anatomic reduction is necessary uh, for function. Um, so that said, very few cases are treated non-surgically, certainly when both bones are fractured, although many so-called nightstick fractures that are isolated to the ulna um, can be treated um, uh, non-surgically. Uh, non so um, all unstable, all open fractures, and uh, the majority of both bone fractures you're going to see, or vast majority, are going to be treated operatively. Um, so the goals of uh, treatment are uh, anatomic reduction uh, when possible, rigid fixation to allow range of motion, uh, with a stable construct and restoration of that radial bow. So early surgery is desirable, uh, but not essential. Problem is you get sometimes significant shortening, um, and um, it can be a little, little bit of work to get it back out to length. Um, so the, the longer you wait, the harder that gets. Um, you know, delayed surgery, if there really are poor soft tissues or there are other injuries or medical problems, Preventing you to go sooner might happen. Um, open fractures, obviously you want to treat with uh, antibiotics, tetanus, early debridement, irrigation, um, and then surgical treatment, uh, ORIF uh, for most fractures, although X-Fix um, can be considered in uh, um, some of the more severe open injuries. And I think there's also a role sometimes for intramedullary nailing in some of those severe open injuries. So fixation options include intramedullary nailing, external fixation, and uh, plate fixation. But this is an area where, by and large, 99% of the time, this is generally what's going to be done for the most of the fracture patterns you're going to see. Uh, whereas uh, these are typically for extreme cases. And maybe you're at a center where you see a lot of extreme cases. But on average, compression plating or plating in general uh, is your treatment of choice. A couple of words about IM fixation. It's certainly not routinely used. Um, I think it can be helpful in cases where you have um, severe soft tissue injury, uh, perhaps severe soft tissue injury in uh, combination with perhaps just an isolated uh, fracture uh, of one bone, uh, perhaps. Um, so maybe a bad gunshot injury or something like that where you have maybe some bad soft tissue injury and only one bone fractured. Um, uh, pathologic fractures, perhaps, and, and in general, if you need to span the entire bone. I think that's where, that's where this concept comes in. So uh, that could also apply, perhaps, to a segmentally comminuted fracture, as long as you feel you can maintain length. And a lot of these nails have a little bit of difficulty maintaining length compared to uh, plate fixation. X-Fix can have a role for severe open fractures. But plate fixation really provides the best treatment uh, in most cases. So it provides stable, good anatomic fixation, eliminates the need for external casting, and therefore allows early functional motion. Um, you can potentially obtain anatomic reduction um, in most of the fracture patterns. In highly comminuted fractures, it may be very difficult. Um, it can help to restore ulna and radial length, which in certain fracture patterns, especially with Montagia lesions, prevent subluxation of the, of the uh, radial ulnar joint. And we'll get into that uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, you want to absolutely make sure you restore rotational alignment, and you want to sort of, sort of test rotation at the end of your case. And you need to restore radial bow, as we talked about in the last uh, part of this um, presentation, which is essential for rotational function of the forearm. 
Now the ulna approach is relatively straightforward. It's exposed along the subcutaneous border between the flexor carpi and I'm sorry, between the flexor and uh, extensor carpi ulnaris muscles. Um, you do have to be careful when you get distally not to injure the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve. The radius can be approached either from a volar henry type approach, which is commonly done in the middle and distal thirds. When you get proximally, the problem is you get very deep. Um, the radial artery kind of crosses your field, and uh, in a larger or muscular patient, it can be very difficult getting down there. Uh, the Thompson approach, uh, however, can um, be a little easier when working proximally. Um, so it's good for proximal to middle thirds. Okay. Here's the Henry approach. Um, you kind of uh, identify the biceps tendon proximally, start one centimeter laterally, and then extend towards the uh, uh, radial uh, styloid, and you can often palpate the um, flexor carpi uh, radialis tendon. Um, intervals between the brachioradialis and the FCR. Uh, here you have to make sure you identify and protect the radial artery and the superficial uh, radial nerve. Proximally, you have to make sure you don't get into the posterior interosseous nerve, but typically the volar henry approach, you don't get quite that proximal, as opposed to the Thompson approach. Um, so incision goes just anterior to the lateral epicondyle towards uh, the ulnar side of Lister's tubercle. Um, this, um, you, you go um, between the ECRB and the extensor digitorum uh, commonus, proximally exposing the supinator muscle. So here's a sort of view and a zoomed in view. You have to identify the posterior interosseous nerve, right? So this is really important here. And if you um, expose your muscles, expose the supinator muscle, you know, the supinator muscle typically runs this way, right? And you have to recognize where the, the posterior interosseous nerve is running this way. So it's pretty much transverse to the muscle fibers. So you need to identify it. Most likely it's going to be where it enters or exits. Um, and, and, and then as you, you're going to split the muscle and you have to make sure you keep ident trying to identify and palpate for the nerve um, as, you, uh, as you expose in this direction. Okay. But once you identify it, you can you know, very carefully retract it, try not to vigorously really retract it, and uh, you can then expose the radius proximally. So some intraoperative tips. Um, most surgeons, um, certainly the way I do it also, is supine with a hand table, uh, tourniquet approach. Usually you approach the simpler fracture first. Now why is that? Well, because you're more likely to get an anatomic reduction on the simpler fracture, okay? Uh, as opposed to tackling the more comminuted, difficult fracture, and you're off by a little bit, uh, and then you can't uh, you can't get the simpler fracture reduced properly, for instance. Or you, uh, so you know, getting the simpler fracture first gets you anatomic, gets you out to length, and it's a better way to go, I think. Um, so re reduce and provisionally fix if needed. Um, approach the other fracture. Now I would say you know I usually will. Put the plate on that I, uh, I'm going to use to fix it. Uh, if I'm in doubt, I may only put in a few screws or the plate holding um, devices. Uh, but if, I, if I'm quite certain I'm anatomic, I'll, I'll usually go ahead and fix it. Uh, and then uh, approach the other fracture, um, which uh, can be difficult if you have a whole lot of pins and wires or, uh, or if you don't have reasonable fixation because the fracture could come apart. Um, but keep both incisions open because you may have to go back and take something apart um, on the one bone if you can't get the other bone reduced. Uh, reduce and, and plate with um, compression plates, okay, either a locking plate or non-locking plates. Uh, the goal is six cortices above and below uh, with three screws or, um, or uh, o over four or more holes on each side. Okay. Um, Check and uh, modify the reduction of the other bone as needed. Uh, plate with um, uh, your plate with compression mode for the other bone. And um, again, six cortices. Confirm your reduction with C-arm. Uh, irrigate, close the ulna wound first. And then you irrigate and close the radial wound. Um, if you really can't close it, sometimes it's better to use a vac and return rather than closing a wound too, too tight and then getting a compartment syndrome. 
Uh, you can bone graft if absolutely necessary, if there's severe bone loss or the patient has um, you know, uh, open fracture, severely compromising bone biology, and it's your decision whether you bone graft an open forearm fracture acutely or, coming, or come back and doing it later. Um, and uh, interfragmentary can, uh, compression can be very difficult if you have a fair amount of bone loss. Uh, so try to preserve the soft tissue attachments where possible. Minimize your periosteal stripping when you can. Uh, use uh, narrow attractors to avoid the uh, penetration of the interosseous membrane. And uh, if you can't get the wounds closed or if an op it's an open fracture, uh, try to get it done soon and not leave these open to the environment for too long. Uh, Post-op, uh, you may need to splint the patient uh, depending on uh, how aggressive or uh, conservative you want to be. Um, simple fractures where you want to start motion right away, you potentially can avoid the splint, but in many cases you may want to splint for a very short period of time and certainly if you have any type of longitudinal forearm instability like a Montagia or Galeazzi, uh, you may have to immobilize them uh, for a period of time to prevent instability. Uh, closely monitor compartments, uh, have a low threshold to split open the dressings if the patient's complaining of what seems like a tight dressing. Um, definitely you want to start finger range of motion right away um, and uh, you may want to delay wrist and elbow motion for a few days to prevent uh, additional bleeding and hematoma formation and wound problems. Um, Forearm rotation can be initiated as soon as the patient's comfort allows. So um, again, depending on how aggressive or conservative you want to be, you may want to do it earlier or later, but you don't want to wait too long. Um, and then you get follow-up x-rays at each visit, uh, and you can spread them out over time. And um, activities should be modified to ADLs only until the fracture is healed. You, re you really don't want to be lifting anything heavy or carrying or pushing and pulling anything heavy early on, and then hopefully you get back to your normal lifestyle. So I'm going to pause there and we'll finish up uh, with the last portion of this uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation um, in the next slides. Thanks.